Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast and uh, the world's longest running medical podcast. And uh, this time we've got um, a very exciting podcast because it's about the image of the year for 2021 and um, it relates to um, using PET scans to look at the effects of COVID on the brain, the long COVID if you like. And um, and uh, Gunnar, uh, she's done some research uh, doing FTG scans, um, and uh, and uh, so I'll get her. I'll hand over to her. She can tell you a little bit of where she works and uh, what work she's done. Uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction and invitation uh, to join the podcast. This is for sure an honor for us to get a prize and to be um, awarded with the Image of the Year award. And yeah, I'm Ganna Blasenitz and I'm a postgraduate at the Public University Hospital and I'm working in the lab of uh, Professor Philip Meyer. And uh, we joined, uh, we used this possibility to examine the patients with a COVID and neurological symptoms with FTG PET to build a study. Yeah. How many subjects did you scan and um, when did you scan them in the disease process? Uh, the, the patients. Um, so we established the we, we noticed this, um, this neurological symptoms in our patients uh, that were um, just um, because of their um, they developed disturbance of gas and addiction and other less common neurological symptoms and they were our inpatients at the hospital so they were screened on a regular basis and after noticing the symptoms in a, in a large portion of patients we established the neurocognitive registry and patients with a PCR um, positive um, SARS-CoV-2 infections were included and so we started inclusion of patients early in April 2020 um, when the first uh, so to say COVID wave started in Germany and um, we included uh, at this time um, to end of the May around thirty patients that we used like in our first study. Right, and, and you f you followed them up again six months later, right? Is that right? Yeah, not all of the patients were eligible for active PET, so if there were more patients screened with neurological tests as MOCA or neuropsychological battery as battery, and only patients with the present at least two new neurological symptoms were um, eligible for active PET, and there was around um, fourteen patients and. Eight of them um, also stayed uh, uh, or also like were involved for a follow-up study six months later. So we were able to track longitudinally the changes in uh, metabolism of these patients. So um, you chose to do FTG PET, and FTG um, we know has been used for um, for various neurological disorders. It's often used for uh, Alzheimer's, but it, it's, it can be used for frontal temporal disease and, and other diseases as well, neurological diseases, because they show a different pattern, if you like, uh, in those diseases. Is that why you chose FTG PET? Uh, yeah, that is one of the reasons. Um, another reason, FTG PET is really widely available. So it is established by a marker of uh, neuronal damage and also to some extent of um, inflammation. So we decided to not use any more specific biomarkers because we wanted to um, explore the general nature of this cognitive impairment in patients. And FGT that was, um, yeah, in my opinion, the optimal choice. And also this is a part of our clinical routine. So we were able uh, to enroll a lot of patients uh, because the FGT pad is um, easy to use and it doesn't require you like a long scan and not much of preparation. So... Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it would require some preparation to check the uh, sugar status and things like that, would it? Because that can affect the brain. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we ensured that patients were fasted at least six hours before, and we also checked the uh, neuroclinical levels of patients before the scan. So, yeah, in order to exclude this effect, so for sure. But this is also a part of our clinical routine. Right, and um, I think it's there's been quite a lot of studies that have shown some cog cognitive deficit, um, including some that have come out um, the last few days that that, uh, that that show there has there is a cognitive decrease, a decrease in intelligence, if you like, um, from COVID. Um, it's nice to have an objective though uh, measure of that, something that we can actually see, and that's the advantage of doing a PET scan, right? Yeah, for sure. Because uh, now, um, also like the aspect of media, probably a lot of patients aware that um, there might be some changes, and maybe there is more like a subjective 
um, also complain. So we have to be sure that we really like, explore where this comes from, if this is really from COVID or it's more like a general pandemic effect um, on cognition of population and so on. So uh, we continue to enroll patients and uh, we also run another studies uh, on patients with a so-called long COVID syndrome as it has to be a little bit um, separated from acute patients and also patients with a um, kind of um, acute infections and post-COVID syndrome. So there are some differences. So tell us what you found. Yeah. Um, maybe I can share my screen. Sure. Um, so, as I said, we enrolled um, around 30 patients with the discharge gas infection, and also some of them had a cranial narcosis, and these were patients with a SARS-CoV-2, the PCR-confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, and they were enrolled around one month um, uh, post-detection um, um, of um, virus, but at the point they were not anymore uh, infected with um, so they will not spread the virus around the clinic. And also patients with the primorbid neurological conditions as dementia and ICU treatment were excluded because um, yeah, there would be a little bit of um, uncertainties that can also influence the effect. Um, they underwent the neurological examinations as in um, battery with a Montreal cognitive assessment scale. And um, patients with two new neurological symptoms also were eligible for multimodal imaging with FGG PET and MRI. Um, so based on FGG PET, we actually found that two sorts of patients have shown pathological results based on, on like uh, expert visual reads. And you can see the example, uh, this is like an example of um, a normal graded patients and abnormal. You see that there's the extensive cortical hypermetabolism around the neocortices. Yes, it's very obvious, isn't it? Uh, yes. You've got, a, you've got a fairly large region of cortical uh, decreased uptake, right, relative to the... Uh, yeah, and this is uh, at some point really um, disturbed us a lot because uh, it, it was also interesting if this is a um, reversible process or not, if it's only because of a direct uh, virus um, influence on the brain or it's more like a secondary effect and they also investigated this and there are um, fortunately more studies on pathology that uh, helped us to answer this question and also I investigated of different um, ways how the viruses propagate to the brain. Right and I noticed there was disturbed uh, olfaction as well so the, the, the um, uh, certainly a change in, in smell oh, he, and, um, and you're just displaying up here the um, uh, the relative uh, convergence pattern, um, the difference. So, uh, so you've got a, quite a, a significant, uh, um, a quantitative change as well that we can see. Yeah, and so we um, we wanted to use some techniques that is more like objectives and visual reads by experts. Also, so um, in, in, also like uh, for FGG pad, you, have, you always have to select the region which is not affected by the disease. So you can use it as a reference for data normalization if you do any group comparisons. And therefore, we were looking for techniques that will allow us to do so. And um, this is the principal component analysis. And this was um, already shown to have a value in diagnosis and prognosis of various disorders. So we applied this technique to a group of uh, COVID patients and control group. Constructed the, so how we call it COVID nineteen related spatial covariance pattern, and as you see it um, it, ha it has the regions with extensive um, with the voxels with negative rates it represents regions with the, um, hypermetabolism and it's uh, mainly uh, frontal parietal regions and uh, um, tau to some extent and regions with the preserved metabolism which is like a white matter and also cerebellum. Um, yeah, so we constructed this pattern based on FDG PET data and then applied it uh, to check what the similarities between the pattern and individual patient's data. But this we constructed, um, we calculated the pattern expression score. So it's a value that reflects the degree to which extent the individual data is similar to this pattern and how it reflects this pattern. Right. And this, this score was very much correlated um, uh, with the uh, cognitive data. So it provides a link between this cognitive impairment in patients and their um, regional 
metabolism, so it's a hypermetabolism in this uh, frontoparietal regions. Right. Um, so, uh, yes, that's quite a substantial change. Was that seen on any other types of imaging that you did? Uh, we also did, uh, we applied this technique to study Alzheimer, so the conversion from MCI stage to Alzheimer dementia, and there are also studies applying this to patients with Parkinson's disorder and, right. um, and other. Yeah, so it's it's quite a substantial change. And uh, um, and uh, so um, what happened six months later? Yeah, I think this is an interesting point because um, as I mentioned, we were interested if this uh, effects are reversible because this is uh, something that the patients are interested, the healthcare professionals also uh, would like to really know. And um, yeah, this is important for society as well. Um, and in comparison to super kid stages, like one month uh, post COVID infection, we see an extensive reversibility. So that's a re extensive recovery of original um, metabolism in all the affected regions six months from now. There are still some residuals that we were able to measure, but I guess, um, if we measure like later, nine or 12 months, we expect that will be completely gone and patients will recover because also their neuronal function, so their cognition was also recovered. So the mean MOCA score was almost normal levels. And um, I have to mention the patients, the eight patients that came for follow-up um, they probably were the patients that are mostly affected because right. other patients, they rejected follow-up because they didn't have um, self-perceived complaints. And also they, they, they and their physicians probably didn't um, saw um, the importance or like the requirement to do a follow-up test. Right. Therefore, we can say, yeah, the see this residues, but um, it probably will also come and patients will completely recover. Right. So it's more like a secondary effect. It's not a direct uh, virus uh, that is uh, causing the um, cortical hypermetabolism, but this is a secondary effect of probably the uh, general inflammation uh, response to inflammation or cytokine release. So the cortex is a secondary effect and therefore it recovers this time. Yeah, well, I think that the um, uh, that that's true in this sample, but I I would imagine if it follows a normal distribution, if you had a very large sample, there would be some people who who might have more severe effects. Um, yeah, for sure, we cannot we cannot really effect. exclude this now. Yeah, um, the other thing is to remember historically after the 19, uh, 20, um, 1918, 1920 flu pandemic, we did have. Uh, considerable cognitive effects for many years afterwards with that one as well. Um, 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 uh, 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 so um, I'm guessing, you know, we may we may see things in following years from subjects that have have, uh, have been affected in this way. Very interesting. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, our sample was really special. The patient, patients were affected severely enough to be eligible for imaging and so on. And, um, detect this with a cognitive test, but they were not that severe to require ICU treatment. Therefore, yeah, you have to um, extrapolate this results to similar populations. So we cannot really, as you said, um, say it for, for global population and so on. Right. And um, in the world, we've had, um, well, millions of people affected by COVID. So you would expect that in a, in a very large sample like that, that there's going to be some people who are going to be more affected than, than those in your particular group, correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but it's good to see that the, the cognitive changes um, that occurred can be documented in a way that, uh, that people aren't feeling that they're, uh, they're imagining it and that it's real. And and certainly you deal with people who have um, uh, who have other neurological disorders. Uh, part of their distress of that is that is that sometimes it's not documented uh, that 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 their disorder is real. And uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I guess this is like a tough for patient if he is uh, or she's like complaining about some uh, memory because these patients uh, also with the mocha testing we saw. Um, are not affected in attention or this domain, they were affected in memory domains mostly. Um, therefore, it's, it can be also treated as a subjective decline. So we were um, glad to help patients to justify that these are not some imaginary problems that they have, but also 
this could be treated in some way. Right, and people with chronic fatigue, for example, um, feel that can often feel bad because they feel that people think that what they've got is imaginary, right? So, yeah. so, um, so I, I think there's some clinical benefit to that in, in a way. Yeah, I should like um, first of all, uh, clinicians has to be aware of the effect, and patients has to be allocated to some rehabilitation programs. And yeah, so the COVID. Uh, I, um, has really like heated uh, the world with, from different perspectives, not only uh, socio-economically, but also like uh, from each individual point. So, right, right. Well, this is very interesting. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add about what uh, what you did and uh, what, what you're doing next, and where people can find out a bit more about this? Um, the study was published um, in. in, in two- in acute patients were published in brain disorders in 21. I was a host uh, at all as a first author, and uh, the follow up study was uh, published in GNN. You can also find it online. Both are open access. Uh, we try to promote the research and keep the information like uh, um, all of the available access that we have. We are also working further on patients with the long COVID syndrome and with the different uh, imaging perspectives. Um, yeah, and, and there's like nowadays more and more studies with FG pad on COVID patients arising. And there are different cohorts and completely different patients, but uh, in general, there are many studies that have shown similar results. You can also find it um, online. I also would like to um, thank Society for, um, for selection for this award. This is a big honor for our group. And I also would like to say thank you for. Um, collaboration partners and for group members and for everyone who contributed to the study. Yes, in particular the patients. They're the most important people yes. when you're doing research and uh, yeah. um, we can't forget them. Uh, thank you very much for taking part in the podcast. I really appreciate it. And um, and uh, we'll, um, uh, uh, we'll be looking forward to your future research. I gather you're going to be doing some more stuff with MRI as well. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we have. Um, we didn't find anything with the uh, standard anatomical MRI imaging of these patients. Right. Uh, therefore, we applied more advanced techniques and uh, looked to more like microstructural changes. And um, I'd not like to not spoil it that much, but um, we see some differences. And there's a correlated FDG pad, so it's going to be ah, um, okay. also a very interesting study. Yes, I think so. Perhaps synap- synaptic markers as well. I mean, I think the the, the synaptic markers might might change in this as well. They're, that's a new area that the brain pit is is coming along quite nicely with as well. Yeah, I also hope someone then uh, some more like a new inflammatory mark markers, as a TSPO or some other stuff that is ah, yes, can directly do the um, detection of virus if if there is virus in brain. Um, yeah. And we also have plans to maybe do um, not only on COVID, but maybe there will be another base of flu or like influenza and so on. Well because we, I, as you mentioned, the patient has some uh, long-term consequences and maybe there is also um, reasons for this that we can detect with that digital. Yeah, um, well, I said... Um, uh, 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 what was it um, synthetica um, um, lethargica um, was 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 the uh, uh, that was discovered in Germany too, wasn't it? The 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 long long um, long pandemic flu uh, syndrome. So yes, I think uh, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. So that was uh, uh, that 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 certainly was a case after the um, nineteen eighteen two um, uh, and uh, flu pandemic. Uh, there was. Uh, long-term neurological sequel of this. So it'd be great to uh, to do that and and maybe Parkinson's and other other disease markers might be be seen as well, um, particularly when we're seeing changes in olfactory. That's that's often something we see in Parkinson's disease. Yeah. yeah. So so very interesting. And and thank you very much for taking part in the podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure.